Some of you have uh, heard the, the British expression, declare your interest. And I, I spent uh, a, about a month in Oxford, England once, and I, I was sitting in cafes doing some studying, and I would occasionally hear uh, Br British business persons discussing, and often this phrase would come up, declare your interest. And, uh, you know, that means something like, tell me what your bottom line is, uh, where are you coming from, what's your primary motivation, uh, what do you hope to get out of our, our meeting. And uh, I find that very refreshing. It's an assertive kind of statement, but very, very important. Anyway, I, have, I try to declare my interest uh, everywhere I talk and everything I do. And so I want to tell you that I'm a Baha'i with a Unitarian background. I served as a Unitarian minister 25 years, been a Baha'i over the last seven years. Before that, I was, uh, what, influenced by various forms of liberal Christianity and liberal Judaism. I've got a lot of interfaith experience, and uh, I've even spent uh, some years being an atheist, a, a kind of a skeptic regarding religion as a whole. Uh, when I say I'm a Baha'i, I mean I believe that all major religions are true and pure in their origins, that uh, science and religion are complementary systems of, of knowledge, and that world unity is humanity's primary task over the next millennium. I try to neither uh, promote my beliefs nor hide my beliefs. I believe it's, it's more objective to admit that you're not completely objective. In other words, everybody has a perspective. Everyone, you know, can declare their interest if, if they're honest. And I think that uh, presenting myself this way improves the odds that you can learn the most and I can learn the most by your reaction to me. I'm trying to create uh, intellectual openness and religious safety everywhere I go, and no one should impose their views on others. Today I'm talking uh, kind of as a, if you have to label uh, the, the point of reference. I'm a philosopher of global religion. Uh, it sounds maybe a little bit presumptuous, but I've always been philosophically oriented, and uh, my favorite content area is global religion with a lot of uh, special interest in the future, the future of humanity. So I'm trying to be kind of a bridge builder between different perspectives, whether they're religious or philosophical. I want us to look quickly at that handout. I'm going to use this as a basis for what I say. I'll say a little bit more than what's on the handout. But uh, So our, our topic is, is, if there is one God, why are there so many religions? And I offer some working definitions of the term God and religion there. And then I have four sections here. The first section is uh, making a skeptical interpretation of our theme question. Uh, it's looking at the point of view that there is no God uh, and that that explains why there's so many religions. Uh, there is not a single God. And then I look at the affirmative interpretation of the theme, and that is that one God has generated many religions in compassion for humanity's diverse and developmental nature. And then if you turn over the handout, you'll see the third section is a set of what I call parallel questions. Uh, I use this a lot. It, when I'm working with a hard question or a hard topic, sometimes it helps to come up with a parallel question that casts light on, on what you're working on. So I've come up with seven parallel questions to our theme question, along with some short answers there. And all that leads up to section four, which is addressing the theme question directly, if there is only one God, why so many religions? Okay. So regarding the working definitions, there, there's two big words in this topic, and one is God and the other is religion. Uh, I find it helpful to realize that about seven-eighths of the world thinks of God as something like the unique, all-knowing, all-benevolent, and unlimited power in the universe. Uh, unique, all-knowing, all-benevolent, and unlimited power. So that's sort of a the, the, the people who are more academically oriented in all the major religions think of God roughly as, as something like that. Now, uh, about one-eighth of the world's population uh, doesn't have any use for God and thinks of God as merely a name for the unknown and representing unfounded hope. So in other words, God is something that human beings invent and has no objective existence from that point of view. So those are two ways of thinking about uh, the term God. The term religion, um, I believe, again, seven-eighths of the world 
would say religion has something to do with divine guidance, something that comes down from above, so to speak, uh, divine guidance offered to humanity. But I would say about an eighth of the world uh, thinks of religion as something humanly created. Religion is about human aspiration and failure and has something to do with the highest ideals, either that have been achieved or that have been aimed at, but uh, that we fall short of. Again, so it's about the same percentages. We're talking about God and religion from the point of view of a majority perspective and a minority perspective. Okay, um, so going to the first section there, the skeptical interpretation of the theme. Um, I have sort of used this question in different kinds of settings. If there's one God, why so many religions? And I discovered that for some people, that very question has a little bit of an argument in it in the first place. It, it's sort of, there, there can't be a God if there's so many religions. That, that sort of settles it. Right? So the very existence of many religions can lead to skepticism about the existence of God. Uh, and in fact, makes the idea of a unitary God seem very improbable. I have put here four uh, other arguments uh, that are quite common uh, against the existence of God, and I have to tell you, I have very, a lot of respect for these, these arguments. I, I now have come up, uh, I've come to a different position. Uh, I believe in God, but I have respect for these arguments against God, and I want us to look at them. One point of view says that God is an unnecessary hypothesis, that what we should strive for is natural explanations. So scientifically oriented people uh, have this point of view. God is a sort of a, an extraneous or an unnecessary hypothesis. Uh, I want to ask about that, though. Uh, is it really unnecessary? A great part of human experience seems to want to intuit an order of meaning behind what we can see. Uh, the artistic realm, people who are artists of various kinds also are, are looking for patterns of meaning that are behind the visible world or underneath it. So it looks like some of human experience, or even a great deal of it, is unsatisfied with purely naturalistic explanations, although I believe we should push them as far as we can. We need science to be free to explain as much as it can with naturalistic explanations. Look at this second argument against God's existence, um, that the fact that there is undeserved suffering in the world and unpunished evil, those are two sets of phenomena that make the existence of God seem very improbable. Um, behind this point of view is the idea that God, it, if God existed, God would be an all-powerful and an all-benevolent being. And since we see innocents suffering and evil people seemingly going unpunished, where is God? Asleep at the switch from that point of view. Why would a good God allow innocents to suffer? You know, things happen in wars like bullets bounce off of walls and, and uh, you know, strike uh, innocent babies dead. You know, where, where is God uh, if, if that can happen? And a traditional religious answer to this, you know, by the theologians and philosophers of the various religions, religious traditions, says something like, uh, God has to, is trying to maintain human freedom and natural law. Uh, therefore, there are laws in place whereby bullets can bounce off walls and kill innocent babies. Earthquakes can happen. Innocent people can suffer as a result of them. So in order to give human beings choice and in order to maintain natural law, evil things can happen. Um, I once did a thought experiment. I, probably, I guess that almost everyone uh, has done this. Have you ever tried to figure out if you could design a better universe than God? I think people think like that uh, occasionally. It's sort of built into our consciousness. And, uh, you know, the first thing you want to do when you improve the universe is to get rid of evil, design a universe without evil. And I remember spending like three days, I was totally obsessed with this little experiment. And uh, what I came to realize is that if we eliminated evil, we would have to eliminate human choice and freedom. We would also have to eliminate horrible accidents like earthquakes and diseases, and that would mean we were wiping out natural law. And when you wipe out natural law, you wipe out science. When you don't have uh, freedom or choice, you wipe out moral and spiritual growth. You also wipe out creativity. 
So I started to realize there's a very high price for reconstructing the universe other than it actually is, which is uh, seemingly a universe in which human beings have a degree of freedom and in which there's natural law. So I forgave God for allowing this to be uh, a universe in which bad things can happen and even innocents can suffer. The third argument, atrocities committed in the name of religion eliminate religion's credibility. Woo, this is quite, quite powerful. So if we're aware of human history, uh, we know that things like crusades have happened in which innocents suffer. Uh, inquisitions occur where torture is used uh, as an instrument to serve so-called religious purposes. Witch burnings in which millions and millions of women lost their lives over several centuries. Pogroms that, uh, in Russia, you know, that are either ignored or partly sponsored by Eastern Orthodox Christianity. There, has, there have been uh, many instances of Christian colonialism, of course, that has marked uh, human history, and that sometimes has entailed genocide of various kinds. Of course, in today's world, we have Islamist terrorism. So these are all very, very telling cases where enormous abuse is done under uh, the banner of religion. But what I have to ask is, is religion itself to blame for the evils done in the name of religion? Now, uh, to me, this is a very important distinction. Religion itself and what people do under the banner of religion. And I, I ask a parallel question. I, here's the first use of these parallel questions. Uh, would it be fair to blame science itself for evils done with scientific research? So we can use the powerful tools of scientific research to develop a better torture chamber or to make more efficient... Uh, say, chemical or biological weapons or, or weapons of mass destruction of another variety. So science can be misused or it can be used for evil purposes, but not too many people want to blame science for that. They want to blame people for that or governments who sponsor those kind of activities. Okay, so what I believe is that religion uh, itself is, is more or less uh, pure. It begins purely. It offers moral and spiritual virtues, which, if followed, would, would help uh, construct a beautiful civilization. Uh, science itself is, is reasonably pure. It's a method for uh, understanding the physical world. And with that information, we can do wonderful things, like uh, establish uh, medical practices, uh, you know, come up with uh, better foods, uh, etc. We can improve the world with science, but it can be misused, so can religion be misused. Look at the fourth argument against God, that the divine nature is notoriously unclear. You have very intelligent people uh, having different definitions of God, very intelligent people denying the existence of God. It's all very unclear, so why would you want to build an ethical system uh, or develop a society based on, on a concept of God. So this is the point of view called agnosticism. And um, what I would ask about that is, does the difficulty of a subject make its existence unlikely? Not necessarily. I, I often think of agnosticism as a little bit intellectually lazy. I, I see this in myself. Sometimes I'm an agnostic about a topic because I don't want to think about it, uh, you know, very clearly or very energetically. So anyway, these are four arguments for the existence of God. I've challenged them a little bit. Uh, very, very good and kind and intelligent people have disbelieved in God. Uh, I'm trying to show respect for that point of view. I want to um, now talk a little bit about uh, the consequences of, of disbelieving in God. Um, and by this I mean psychological consequences. Um, and, and I don't think I'm speaking absolute truth here. This is theory, in part. Many people who do not believe in God tend to have uh, an ethical system that's very relativistic. That is to say, it's hard to establish an ultimate ground for your ethical system, that ultimately you're pressed into a kind of uh, a more and more absolute relativism, that people 
you know, have a right to believe what they believe ethically, because there's no specific ultimate ground you can appeal to. Um, religion, from this point of view, has no objective significance. Uh, it's very easy to be prejudiced against religious people if you don't believe in God. Um, sometimes when you don't believe in God, you can become very opportunistic or egoistic. Uh, you can have a very weak conscience. It's possible to develop a might-makes-right position. Since we can't know for sure, maybe it's simply power that, that really decides issues. Some people who don't believe in God become very antisocial or criminal. They can conclude that a life is meaningless and can become nihilistic or suicidal. Now, I'm not saying all of that follows from not believing in God. It may. Th these are possibilities that can occur psychologically with that belief. If I look at the, uh, the point of view that God exists and look at some of the consequences, it means you, you believe there's some kind of an ultimate ground. It means your ethics uh, you know, has a basis. It means you believe that religion has significance. It means that you have fear of and hope for the afterlife. Believing in God might make you prejudice against people who don't believe in God. Right? You might think they're evil you might, without checking out their individual characters. I myself know that some atheistic people are very highly principled and ethical and you can trust your life uh, with them. Uh, bet your life on, on their coming through. Um, other consequences of believing in God are that you see life as meaningful, you tend to have fear of God on one hand and love of God on the other. Fear of God, I want to mention a consequence of fear of God. Uh, would you rather live in a kingdom that's led by a king who has fear of God, or would you rather live in a kingdom uh, of a king who has no fear of God? If you think about this kind of carefully, you might realize it's safer to live in a kingdom led by a king who has fear of God. Because if the king has fear of God, uh, he's afraid of being unjust. He believes there's an omniscient force watching him calling him to account, he, he's more likely to set up a just system, I believe, than a king who has no fear of God, either because uh, he feels greater than God or because he thinks God doesn't exist. So fear of God might seem like a kind of a, a not too popular virtue, but if you look at some of the consequences of it, uh, you can see that it can bring about justice in the world. People who believe in God tend to believe in ethical and spiritual refinement as a possibility to be developed throughout their lifespan. These are only some of the consequences of belief and disbelief, and I don't think these are logically connected. It's more psychological, and I'm just trying to paint a portrait of two different attitudes toward the question. Okay, now I want to turn to that section two in, uh, in the handout where it's the affirmative interpretation of the theme. If there is only one God, why are there so many religions? Possibly one God has generated many religions. Why? In compassion for humanity's diverse and developmental nature. So what I've got here are some of the arguments for the existence of God. Uh, you might have heard these and studied these in philosophy courses. Uh, I put them in my own form and I just want to look at them uh, in groups. The first three are sometimes called uh, the cosmological argument. It says something like, uh, since everything is caused, the universe as a whole must have a first cause or a creator. Um, or since everything shows some kind of uh, degree of order, design, or purpose, that is everything that's natural that we can experience uh, shows some degree of order and purpose, that seems to suggest a master designer of all things. And then the argument from systems says that uh, all systems seem to require an, an outside form of energy. In other words, you and I are a system, our body is a system, and sooner or later we have to eat something or drink something. All systems are like that in requiring an external source. That seems to suggest that the universe as a whole requires an infinite source of energy outside of it or else it would have wound down by now. Everything seems to wind down. The universe isn't winding down. It perhaps has a, an outside external source. 
All those are, uh, I, these arguments, incidentally, are sometimes called proofs. And I don't think of them as proofs. They're, they're not logical, uh, rigorous demonstrations of something you have to believe. But they seem to be little packages of reasoning that suggest that the God hypothesis is reasonable. I'm going to go on to another one here, more, a more complex one. The argument from human evolution and complexity. Since human evolution has resulted in an extremely complex and improbable being, namely me and you, the human species, it must have been produced by a deliberate intelligence for it could not have been accidental nor necessary. A little bit of background here. I discovered that in the Middle Ages, there were some very brilliant minds among Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and generating very sophisticated theological systems. And I'm thinking especially of Maimonides for the Jews, and Al-Ghazali uh, for Muslims, and Thomas Aquinas for Christians. And all three of them had a version of this argument whereby the assumption behind it is that everything that is a formation of any kind, let's say a human being or a mountain, any formation of any kind has to have been either accidental or necessary or voluntary. In other words, uh, it's put together, so to speak, uh, uh, accidentally or, or by necessity, that is, as an extrapolation of some kind of invariable universal law, or that it's put together intentionally. Um, okay, so if you look at human beings or the universe as a whole uh, and say, could, could it be an accident? Well, it couldn't be an accident if everything is causal. So that, that sort of wipes out that one-third of the pie. Uh, could, could, human being, could human existence or the universe as a whole be necessary? Uh, human, human beings don't appear to be necessary because if something's necessary, it has to exist and it continues to exist. Human beings seem to die. They seem to go through a lot of change and disappear. So it doesn't look like human beings are necessary, built into the structure of things and, have, and, and seeming needing to exist eternally. So if we're not accidental nor necessary, and there's only one other choice, we have to have been made. We have to be the result of some kind of superior intention of some kind. Anyway, that's the way this argument runs. We cannot be purely accidental. We cannot be necessary. That leaves only uh, the option that we are designed or intended by a superior being. Let me jump to the fifth argument here, the argument from, from imperfection. Uh, this is really quite ingenious, I think. Since we perceive many kinds of imperfections in our experience, there must be a higher order of being to which we compare these imperfections. For example, if we recognize weakness of any kind, we must have sensed earlier a higher power or a source of strength. If we discover ignorance of some kind, and that's easy to find ignorance <laughs> in ourselves and in others, then we, we must have assumed a higher truth or a source of knowledge with a capital K. If we behold ugliness, this presupposes a vision of beauty. If we are repelled by an act of evil, we must have embraced a standard of good. If we understand that we're finite creatures, we must have glimpsed an infinite creator. So this is an argument suggesting that the very fact that we can see imperfection suggests that we're aware of, of, an, of a perfect order that gives meaning to all the rest. The argument for morality uh, is next. Since morality exists and is indispensable to, in human life, there must be a fair standard as well as a judge with the power to enforce rules. Uh, very interesting. This one sort of appeared to Immanuel Kant and some other thinkers. Hu immorality of some kind seems built into human consciousness. We're utterly dependent on it, and it does presuppose some kind of a, a judge with the power to enforce rules, if not in this life, then perhaps in another. Right? The argument from beauty. You may not have heard this one. Since beauty predominates over ugliness in the creation, there must be a fashioner of beauty who has shared aesthetic capacity with us. 
I want to tell you that a, a personal story. This little argument sort of saved my life once. I was feeling suicidal. I, I tend to believe almost everyone feels suicidal at some point. And uh, I think in my third year of college, I was feeling sort of down and depressed because it seemed to me that all these brilliant professors were disagreeing with each other and we really couldn't know the truth about anything at all. I found that rather depressing. I'm sort of a truth seeker and uh, you know, to actually s glimpse the possibility that maybe no one knows what they're talking about was, was very, very depressing to me. So I, I sort of went off on a, oh, sat on the edge of a cliff one day and uh, near the campus and I was contemplating jumping over it and uh, you know this was near the e evening and I started to see a, a beautiful sunset form and I got entranced with the beautiful sunset and you know here was this orange ball and a blue black ground and wonderful hues and and I suddenly realized wait a second I'm here to commit suicide what am I doing getting interested in the beauty of the world I started to believe in God, like what gave me the power to appreciate this beauty? Who set all this up in the first place? So this is a little bit of an insight into the argument from beauty. Um, next, last one, the argument from revelation. This is what I've been focused on for about the last 12 years. Since higher moral and spiritual guidance is given to humanity in regular intervals, there must be a source and revealer of ultimate truth. So. I have been sort of trying to get a handle on the whole panorama of, of uh, human spirituality and religion over the eons. And what appears to me is that there's a lot in common to all of the religions that have occurred. Of course there are differences, but uh, the differences again are organized it seems to me. There are complementary strengths for all of the religions and spiritual orientations. For example, Native spirituality offers a sense of reverence for the wonder of the physical world, for cycles and elemental forces. The Hindu perspective offers tremendous mystical depths and a sense of embracing diversity. The Buddhist point of view focuses on meditation and awareness of compassion as a way of transcending suffering for self and others. The Asian point of view, namely Confucianism and Taoism, emphasize social propriety and natural balance. Jewish point of view focuses on praising creation and uh, arranging covenants with God, moral spiritual agreements with the author of creation. The Christian perspective seems to focus on sacrificial love and social responsibility. See, in my mind, all these things are good. We wouldn't want to throw any of this away. These are complementary strengths that belong to humanity. Just to continue, the Islamic point of view emphasized submission to God, which is an ego reduction pro process, and, pre and uh, detailed justice prescriptions. At its best, Islam had the most exalted legal system humanity has ever seen. The Sikh uh, religion tries to move beyond all kinds of sectarian divisions and bring about a synthetic reform between Hinduism and Islam, the best in those two great world religions. The Baha'i faith focuses on unity of all kinds and the, and the need to establish a new world order. The Unitarian faith uh, emphasizes religious freedom, the, sa the sacredness of religious freedom and the need to respect diversity. All of these are wonderful gifts to humanity or instruments in the orchestra of humanity's spiritual heritage. And they suggest that one source is behind uh, the whole panorama of uh, human religion and spirituality. Okay, now I want to turn quickly to the parallel questions. And I think these really cast some light on the question we're trying to answer here. If there is only one God, why so many religions? You might ask of a school, in one school, why are there several graded classes and teachers? Well, a quick answer might be because learners vary in their maturity levels and capacities. That's why you have a series of teachers and a series of classes. In one song, why are there many notes and varying interpretations? Maybe an answer is to add beauty and richness to our auditory world. In one humanity, why are there many cultures and languages? I remember really pondering this and sort of being angry at God. Why didn't you make people of the same race so that we wouldn't have this racial prejudice which rips 
the heart out of many societies in the world and has caused untold suffering. Why didn't you make that a little easier for us, God? And uh, an answer might be, there are many cultures and languages to stimulate interaction and progress to enrich our civilization building process. Seems to me that's a good reason for having ethnocultural diversity. In the Earth's one living system, why are there many species? It would be simpler if there were only one species. But ecologists tell us this is not the case. Diversity is required for and enriches the ecosystem. We need a variety of species among the plants and animals uh, to have a, a rich living system that makes, uh, say, the Earth ahead of Mars uh, in terms of um, environmental complexity and the diversity of life. What about, it? why isn't there just one science? In the, in the one broad field of science, why are there many sciences with a small s? Physical reality is differentiated. This is part of the answer, I think. Physical reality is differentiated, requiring sub-disciplines of study. So we break science up into sciences. We have specialists, uh, astrophysicists, chemists, biologists, meteorologists, etc. In the one broad field of religion, why are there many religions, small r? Spirituality, spiritual reality, too, is differentiated, yielding complementary truths that the different religions behold and emphasize. If there is one universe, and you know that name, universe means one song, one song. No one seems to deny too much that there's a universe. I know there are beliefs in parallel universes, but most people just take that word wholesale. One universe. Why are there countless galaxies and solar systems in them, in the universe, beyond our ability to count? To me, the answer seems to be that God has opted for unified complexity. God could have opted for nothing or simplicity or chaos. I used to spend a lot of time worrying about this, incidentally. You know, God could have made a simpler universe, something kind of much simpler uh, than we would understand it. But God has not made a simple universe, nor has he made no universe at all, nor has he made a chaotic universe. If it were purely chaotic, there wouldn't be such a thing as science, and we wouldn't say it's all connected with the word universe. It looks like God has opted for unified complexity, which is another way of saying unity in diversity, or one that's differentiated into many. And I think all this casts some light on our topic, the one God and the many religions. Okay, now I want to look at this theme question directly. If there is only one God, why are there so many religions? Here's a one-sentence answer to that, because humanity lacks the capacity to embrace all truth once and for all. We are developmental, as is all of creation. We evolve. We're developmental. We are, have built-in capacities that unfold under certain conditions. That seems to be how the whole universe is, and that casts light on why we would need more than one religion coming at a different time. The one religion of God needs to be renewed after humanity's inevitable declines. God reveals guidance to humanity progressively in a sequence of religions. I'm, 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 I happen to believe this now, but I'm, I'm sharing it as a hypothesis. A hypothesis that makes sense out of the phenomenon of, of religious history. Progressive revelation is the hypothesis that about every 1,000 years or so, God speaks directly to humanity through an intermediary, a manifestation of God renewing universal truth or virtues and bringing fresh social guidance. An example of some of these intermediaries you know well, they're figures like Abraham, Moses, Zoroaster, Krishna, Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, and I believe Baha'u'llah should be on this list. I studied him for 10 years to see if uh, he, he qualified, by my understanding, to be mentioned in the same breath as these others, and I, I slowly came to that conclusion. I believe that all of these figures are human in some respects and divine in other respects, that they share 25 common patterns distinguishing them from merely human sages, seers, and visionaries. 
This book I'm writing, uh, I've been trying to write, working on it for seven years now, uh, it, it has identified 25 patterns that you can find in the lives and teachings of these figures. And you don't find them anywhere else. You find them in these figures alone, I believe. Uh, not quite true. You can find a few of the patterns in other figures like Nanak or Mahavira, founders of other religions, but the 25 are visible in these eight names especially. They are human in some respects, divine in others. Okay, that has caused enormous uh, controversy uh, in, in human history. This arguing about the station of these founders. Are they human? Are they divine? Or are they some combination? My founder is more holy or higher to, closer to God than yours. See, the argument about the station of these figures, extremely controversial. I believe that when you uh, look carefully at what they said and did, they, they provided plenty of evidence that they were both human and divine. They were intermediaries. They were, that's why they could lift humanity to a higher level. They had a higher perspective. They had access to knowledge that the rest of us don't have. They were revealers. They said things that sound contradictory, like, I was sent here by the Father. That sounds like you're subordinate to God. And then they said, uh, this is Jesus talking at the moment, uh, saying things like, I and the Father are one. Or Buddha uh, complaining about all his aches and pains, which is a very human thing to do, and then also saying, I and the Dharma, or the moral spiritual structure of the whole universe, are one. See, so they said both, and I, I came to believe that they were not contradicting themselves. They were both. Other patterns I found, I can't tell you all 25, but I'll allude to some of them. They arose to, uh, they, they, they all said they were part of a sequence of, of revealers. They're just not coming out of the blue. You know, Moses referred to who? Abraham, and before that, Noah, and before that, Adam. A sequence of revealers. Buddha had a similar sequence of Buddhas before him. They all say they're renewing an ancient truth that is now needs to be uh, recast to save humanity. They all arose in, the, in very horrible conditions. If you study when they came, you see that they were needed desperately. There was enormous confusion and violence. They, there was a dramatic divine commission experience of some kind that the believers in all those traditions ponder. They offered a kind of teaching that was totally transformative. Not like any other teaching in a good book that you read and it, it influences you for, say, three months or three years or e even a generation or two. These figures offered a kind of teaching that transformed individuals and societies as well. Uh, an order, many orders of magnitude higher than ordinary human teaching. I found that they uh, all had a theme, a specific theme that integrated their message, which, which was complementary to the themes that the other ones offered. Can't go into those details. They all overcame enormous opposition, another sign that they were not merely human. For example, if you were betting uh, who's going to win, uh, you know, the scribes, Pharisees, uh, Herod and the Romans, or Jesus and his motley crew. Who's going to win that particular power struggle? So they all overcame enormous opposition and were providential forces uh, in human history. Um, they all affirmed four levels of reality, and I would love to go into more detail on this. I can't, but they in effect said human beings are higher than the natural realm. So that's two realms right there. Uh, below us is the natural realm, including uh, animal life, plant life, elemental forces. We're higher than that with one foot in it. Higher than us is this realm I call revelatory, from which truth comes, moral and spiritual truth. Maybe math comes from that level too. An invisible realm higher than the human. But there's, they all refer to something even higher than that, which perhaps could be called the mystery of God, uh, the unknown the absolute, from which all other levels of reality emanate. Sociologically speaking, they all set up enduring foundations. Uh, the shelf life of their innovation, so to speak, was thousands and thousands of years. That's very different than ordinary people, uh, even if they're very, very influential 
human beings. So I'm now back on my last little bit here. The, the great prophets and messengers generate a series of civilizations which educate humanity, and the civilization now emerging seems to me a global one. Um, I think people who are alert to the signs of the times know that we're not forming a, a, a new civilization that's in one part of the world now. We did that for maybe the last 6,000 years, but now what we're doing is forming a global civilization. Lots of evidences of that. Uh, God's way of working seems to be around the theme of one and many or unity and diversity. Unity without diversity would yield a kind of static boredom. I'm very glad we're not 100% united. Uh, diversity without unity would yield random chaos. I'm really glad there's more than absolute diversity. Unified diversity brings wholeness, interaction, and evolutionary progress. The ever-advancing unity of faith and the emerging global civilization will not eliminate human cultural diversity upon which it depends. A very good illustration of this is food. You know, people, uh, if they were assigned uh, by law to only eat the food of their own ethno-cultural group, there would be a worldwide rebellion against that. Right? In other words, we will want to eat Chinese food and Mexican food and French food when we appreciate the diversity of the world. If we were assigned to only listen to music that came out of our ethno-cultural heritage and none other, right, we would rebel. So we have a sense that uh, diversity is here to stay, but unity is required for the world not to self-destruct. One God regenerates or renews religion in compassion for humanity's developmental nature. Unfortunately, we often get attached to one of these renewals, one of these religions, and we believe it's the last one. This has been why humanity has fought with itself. I believe there will be peace in the world when humanity becomes mature enough to embrace progressive revelation as well as the unity of humanity.